Okay. So uh, this is a talk that I originally gave in 2013. And it originally started out with uh, some stuff about fluency, which I thought was really interesting at the time. But I never could quite get the talk to flow together. It felt like there was a beginning part, and then I went into refactoring, and the bits never, never really meshed together. So I cut those parts out. Um, I'm just going to dive right into the code parts. Um, well, almost. Uh, I hate it when speakers spend three minutes, three slides, and like five minutes introducing themselves. So I'll try to keep this part quick. My name is Sam Livingston Gray. Uh, you can find me as Geek Sam on Twitter, GitHub, and Gmail. And uh, the first time I got paid to write code was just over 20 years ago for a project I had to learn Microsoft Access to do. Uh, that got me into Visual Basic. Anybody else here ever do VB? All right, a couple. That's great, like five. Awesome. Um, and I did that for several years until I found myself in a very small job market and my video went away. And uh, <laughs> let me know when that comes back. OK, cool. And uh, so I decided after about four or five years that it was time to uh, try the whole college thing again. Um, I started at uh, Portland Community College in 2003. Graduated, I graduated with a bachelor's in computer science in 2007. And I mention this mostly for two reasons. One, because uh, that program is how I got exposed to a lot of important concepts, uh, including refactoring. Uh, I have uh, two of my textbooks from a object-oriented programming class here. Uh, and I still refer to them. And the other reason I mention this is because I feel like it gives me the credibility to say that you do not need a degree in computer science to be a successful programmer. Um, there are things from computer science that you're going to need to learn because they're going to bite you eventually, but college is not the best place for many of you to learn them, and that's okay. Uh, last but not least, relevant to this group, I've been using Rails since 2006. Okay, right. enough about me. Let's talk about refactoring. What is it? Uh, sorry, I had to start this over again. Okay. Uh, I have a definition here from refactoring.com, and... It is a disciplined technique for restructuring an existing body of code, altering its internal structure without changing its external behavior. And I have no doubt that every word here was carefully chosen, but there are a lot of them. Here are the ones that I feel, feel are most important. If we drop the rest of them, we get a technique for restructuring code without changing behavior. And I think this conveys the same information as the longer definition with fewer distracting details. And that, to me, is really the essence of refactoring. It's about making your code tell a clearer story with fewer distracting details. Uh, speaking of distracting details, one thing I've noticed about refactoring is that it has a lot of jargon. Um, and between people who are two or more experienced practitioners, jargon can be used to communicate complex ideas very concisely, and I like that about it. Uh, however, to a newcomer, jargon can be very intimidating. And so in an attempt to make refactoring a bit more approachable in spite of all the jargon, I would like to propose an alternate definition of refactoring, if I can keep this thing near my face, <laughs> which is uh, instead of a technique for restructuring code without changing behavior, I think of refactoring as a technique for making your code suck less. That less is important. Um, you'll see me a couple of times throughout this talk about making code clearer or cleaner, uh, or suck less. No single refactoring technique will make your code not suck. But if you're working in code that's causing you pain, anything that you can do to reduce that pain, even just a little bit, might bring you just enough relief for you to be able to spot the next thing that you can do to reduce a little more, and then a little more, and a little more. And you can sort of incrementally get your way up above your sort of pain threshold again. All right, so I'm going to tell you a story about some code that I encountered in the wild. If you don't catch everything in this talk, it's OK. Um, there's slides. I'll send them out afterwards. And uh, if a specific step is unclear, I can walk you through it after the talk. Um, just try to follow the overall shape of things. Uh, take in what you want, and you can go back and check my work later. Um, I will mention that every, th every bit of code on this slide has actually been executed. Um, so if there are bugs, they're my fault. So we're going to look at some code from a production Rails application. Um, I did get permission from the owner of the application to use this code in public. I can't hear you too well. OK. Yeah, OK. Let's see what we can do about this. 
Is this any better? Yeah. Let me know if it wanders again. Um, so I got permission to use this in public as long as I changed the details. Excuse me. And so we'll just say that this code comes from a cable company and it's used to schedule installations for new customers. And the fact that I wrote this talk while I was working at Living Social is purely coincidental. These are not the droids you're looking for. Uh, I also want to emphasize that I have a lot of respect for the developers who wrote the original code. We're going to be diving into it, and it is ugly, and I'm going to say some things about it, but I, I want to make it clear that the code was the way it was for a reason, and the reason there was that it was making them a lot of money, and it wasn't crashing. So I had that going for it. It just wasn't amenable to being changed any further, and that's why we refactor. All right. Oh, more on that, actually. Uh, Sometime in the mid to late noughts, uh, one of my teachers named something for me that I had not heard named before, uh, and it stuck with me to this day. What he said was, when a lot of programmers encounter code they didn't write, the first reaction is very often to throw up their hands and go, this is crap, I can't work with this. And I definitely heard myself in that when he said that. And maybe you do too, that's okay. We all have to start somewhere. We all make mistakes. Uh, but what you do when you notice your mistakes is often much more mis significant than the mistake itself. So rather than throwing up your hands and saying this is crap, what would a different reaction be like? Uh, personally, I find it much more useful and interesting to ask, what can this code teach me about why it was written, how it works, and so on? And maybe that makes me sound like a saint. Uh, I'm not. Uh, it's really hard for me to get to that place of compassion for code, especially when I open up my editor and stumble unprepared onto code like this. Now I'm deliberately using a tiny font here to emphasize the shape of the code. You can sort of see that sort of, if you turn your head to one side, it's like a mountain range or something. But um, even from this far back, we can make some very basic observations about this. The file where I found this was about 800 lines long. About 50 of those lines are right here in this method. The longest line is a whopping 177 characters wide. Uh, the initial indentation ranges from 4 to 16 spaces. And that indentation comes from nesting various control structures. There's three kinds of those. Uh, there's this audit trail for method. Um, I realize the code is small. That is what it actually says, is audit trail for something do. And that thing takes a block and then does something with the block. Uh, there's a couple of begin, rescue, end stanzas and there's a whole lot of if statements. Now, I have a theory that once code reaches a certain level of complexity, it tends to get worse and worse over time because your head does this. If it's hard to understand everything that the code is doing, a developer who is working under pressure will make the smallest change that doesn't obviously break anything. Maybe they'll run the tests, you know, if there are tests and if the tests don't take too long to run. Um, and if that all works, they'll breathe a sigh of relief and ship it. Unfortunately, each of those individual choices, while they seem rational at the time, they add up and they leave the code that much more difficult to understand. So once it passes this critical complexity threshold, it just keeps going. And over time, you wind up with a controller that has 800 lines of code. Now, as I mentioned, I've been doing Rails since 2006. And in that time, I've seen a lot of controllers turn into junk drawers. Um, I've personally been responsible for filling up a lot of those junk drawers. In fact, in my current app, I literally have an app slash junk drawer directory. So, you know, not perfect. Um, but at 800 lines for a Ruby controller, this isn't just a junk drawer. This is like an entire cabinet full of rusty cheese graters and broken dreams. And my first instinct on seeing this is to clean all the things. But 800 lines of code, especially Ruby code, which can be pretty dense, uh, it's a lot of things to clean. So I may not have the time or the energy to deal with the whole mess at once, but here's what I can do. I can make the job smaller. Uh, when I ran across this, I decided I was just going to focus on cleaning up this one method, those 50 lines, and the other 750, they'll be there for another day. Now for part, the part that I am going to fix, I already know, just looking at that you know, big overview of the whole thing, that this is going to be nasty and it's going to take a while. So I don't usually do this at the beginning of a refactoring session, but because I knew going in that I was going to make a lot of changes, I'm going to pull out one of the larger refactoring patterns 
um, which is kind of like going to that cabinet of broken dreams and pulling out one drawer and like setting it down right in the middle of the kitchen floor. You take all the stuff out and you put it back a different way. Uh, and the formal name for this refactoring is replace method with method object. And there's a great description of this in Katrina Owen's talk, Therapeutic Refactoring, from about 2013 as well, 2012-2013. Um, and so normally I would assume that you've all seen this, but that was a long time ago. Nonetheless, uh, I'm just going to do a real quick overview of, of this refactoring. Um, here is the Rails controller action uh, with the body of the method folded up. It's just that lots of code thing. The first thing I do is I create a new object that is named after what the method does. So I have the installations controller schedule, and I, have, I create a new class called schedule installation. This new object has one method, which I usually name call. Uh, if you're using the service object pattern or the interactors gem, you might also call this perform. It doesn't really matter. Um, but what I do here is I take the entire body of that original method and I move it into the call method of the new class. And then I run the tests. And everything explodes. Uh, every single one of the tests raises a no method error because the code that I just moved out of the controller sends a bunch of messages to self, things like params and render and redirect to. So now I have to pass the controller into the service object, or the method object, excuse me, um, so that I can send those messages to it instead of to self, which is now a different object. I have a few choices about how I do this because this is Ruby. Uh, I could go through the transplanted method and insert at controller dot everywhere that I'm seeing a no method error. But that sounds like work. Uh, also, I'm still looking at a red test bar and my anxiety level is sort of rising by the second as this goes on. I really don't like doing a lot of work between, green, between passing tests. Another thing I could do would be to use the forwardable mo module in the uh, standard library, which lets you quickly say, delegate these things to that. Um, but I still have to know what the whole list is and that sounds like work too. So I'm going to take door number three, method missing. This is a cheap and ugly hack, but it's also the fastest way to get the tests to pass, so I'll take it. I'll come back to it later, uh, but for now, I want to start digging into the method body proper. The first thing I saw when I opened this up back in 2012 is a branch on request XHR. Um, oh, quick side note for those of you who are newish to Ruby. Uh, yes, methods with a question mark on the end are syntactically valid. Uh, by convention, they should only return true or false. Um, I personally grew up calling these predicate methods. Uh, just last month, I learned that some people also call them interrogative methods. And side note to the side note, Brandon Demcheff is winning at Twitter. <laughs> Y'all need to up your games. This is amazing. I live for shit like this. Anyway, um, so yes, methods with a question mark at the end. Uh, in order to avoid ambiguity when I'm talking about code, I like to I like to pronounce the question mark when I'm when I'm reading it aloud. But question mark is a lot of syllables, so I pronounce it a after the Canadian fashion. So that first line of code, when read aloud, should be if request dot xhr a. So okay. But what does this method actually do? What does it mean? When I saw this, uh, I actually had no idea. Uh, I had to look it up in the docs. And it turns out that XHRA is an alias for XML HTTP request A. So once I understood that, I was guessing that maybe this controller is used from like a plain vanilla HTML interface, and it's also called from JavaScript. And for historical reasons, uh, people were busy those two interfaces are handled differently in some cases. Okay, sure, I'll buy that and I'll keep moving on. So I'm a big fan of code folding in editors. Um, I unfold the next layer of code. It's a begin rescue end. Okay, so I unfold that. And I see this thing that checks to see if the installation is pending a credit check. If so, it renders a bunch of JSON, I don't care what it is, and then it returns. And there's some other code below that, but this pattern already looks familiar to me. This is called a guard clause. This is a name I got from one of my textbooks, uh, Small Talk Best Practice Patterns. Um, this is probably from the late 90s or early 2000s, um, 97. 
Uh, and it's in small talk, but you don't need to know a lot of small talk in order to get stuff out of it. It's a great book. Um, anyway, uh, so that book calls this thing a guard clause, which is basically rather than nesting things in a bunch of ifs, like, well, if, I, if this is true, then I can go ahead. And then if this is true, then I can go ahead. And you wind up like 20 characters off to the right, to the right, excuse me. Um, you just do a guard clause, which says, hey, I can't do this. I'm going to bail. And if, you, if execution gets past there, you know you're OK. So anyway, there's this guard clause here. And I'm wondering, hey, I wonder if there's one on the, on the else branch too. So I unfold that. And I'm expecting to see a parallel begin, rescue, end like I did here. Uh, oh, sorry. But instead, I see another thing that looks like a guard clause. And I'm like, wait, where'd the begin go? Oh, wait, no. It's down after the guard clause. Mm, OK, whatever. So the important thing, though, is that this guard clause sets a flash message and redirects and then continues. So I'm thinking, well, now, like, maybe it's not a guard clause. Like, who writes this? So as I'm, as I'm going through this, at this point, I've completely lost my train of thought. We OK? OK. And after a minute or two of swearing and doing git blame, something catches my eye. So you remember back when I was listing some stats about that method, and I mentioned that the longest line was 177 characters? It's that. It's that one right there. <laughs> so what I'm going to do here is like real simple. I'm just going to take out the and, put the return on a new line, and now I'm comfortable that this guard clause exists on both the HTTP, on both the HTML and the XML um, or AJAX path. Now, they are indented a little bit differently. One of these is inside a begin rescue end, and the other is not. Um, and I stare at this for a while, and I decide that it's probably safe um, and to just take that guard clause and move it up to the up out of the begin end as well, um, because you know technically this could result in a new uncaught exception, but it's just a call to render. I mean, what are the odds that somebody screwed up a call to render? So I run the tests, <laughs> and they're fine. But I did have that moment of like, oh, crap. Uh, so anyway, now that I've identified a chunk of code that does something, I want to get that code out of the way so that it doesn't keep distracting me. Um, one thing uh, that I learned as an adult is that I have ADHD. Um, and so distractions cost me a lot more than they cost some other people. Um, so I make a copy of that branch on request XHRA, and I, move, I put it up above the original one. And then I take each of those guard clauses, and I move it up into the previous if, else, end statement. So now I have two of them. But that first one has both of those guard clauses, and it's, it's ready to go. And this passes all of the tests, but I'm still not quite happy with it, because that if request XHR is now in two places, and I didn't like it to begin with, but oh well. Um, and there is some obvious duplication that's happening here, uh, but there's something subtler going on. Uh, this code is saying the right thing, but the emphasis is on the wrong syllable. I want this code to tell me a story. Um, and I've extracted a preface from that story. It says, hey, if this is true, you can't do this. Don't even bother reading the rest of it. Um, but it still doesn't sound quite right to me. This chunk of code does one thing. If a precondition is not met, if the installation still hasn't passed their credit check, then its job is to complain to the user and die. And that's what it does, but that's not what the shape of the code says. The first thing that it says is, hey, are you an XML HTTP request? And the effect that that has on me as a reader of this code is, it looks like you're working with, working with Ajax. Would you like some help with that? No, I would not. Fortunately, both of the distracting details and the duplication have the same solution. I'm going to take these two layers of if statements, and I'm going to invert them. And to accomplish this, I'm going to uh, use a technique called flattened nested conditionals. Um, this is not in the refactoring book. I stumbled across this in a Dr. Dobbs article by Michael Feathers. Um, it's a useful one to have up your sleeve. So I'm going to go and uh, go through it in some detail at this point. So there are two conditions here. There's that request.xhra, 
and installation.pendingcreditcheck. And to make these slides a little bit easier to follow, I'm just going to take those two long things and I'm going to replace those with two variables because the, the shape of the code is the same. Uh, one is called Ajax and one is called Note. Now this gives us two variables, two chunks of code, and each chunk of code will only be executed with a particular combination of those two variables. This makes sense so far? Have I lost anyone? We're good? Okay. Um, now right now those two conditions, uh, those two states of those variables are implicit in the structure of the code. But as long as we only execute each of those chunks of code under those same conditions, we're free to use any control structure we like. It doesn't have to be two nested if statements. I'm going to start small. I'm going to take that else. I'm going to break it up into an end and an if not. This is the same thing. It's just longer. And now I have two if statements, each of which immediately has another if statement inside of it. And I'm going to take those conditions. I'm going to and them together. And that right there is flattened nested conditionals. This is a really great tool for taking these deeply entangled structures and breaking them apart so that you can deal with each piece in, ice, in relative isolation. Because if you get those right, then you can reorder them, and it doesn't matter. The tests all still pass. But in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two things, and I'm going to put them together in a slightly different way. I've got these two if statements, and nope is common to both of them. So I can take that, and I can pull it up to another if statement that surrounds both of them. Now I can take that pair of if and if not statements, and I can put that back into an else. And at this point, I've done flattened nested conditionals, followed by its inverse nest flattened conditionals. All of that to get rid of one bit of duplication, which was that nope variable right up at the top. As for the other bit of duplication, that return statement, it's the last thing on both branches, so I can legit just move it down to below the if else end. So here's what I started with for this little chunk of code. And here's where I wound up. Go ahead and take a few minutes, moments anyway. Actually, this is a good time to stop and see if anybody has a question. I still can't hear that well. Oh, OK. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, all right. So this, these two snippets of code uh, do exactly the same thing, but in the new version, the version on the right, the reason for the guard clause, the fact that the installation is pending a credit check, is right up there at the top, and the bit about the response handling is kind of secondary. In fact, it's so secondary that I don't even want to look at it right now. I'm going to take that return statement, um, well, rather, now that I've taken that return statement out of the way, this thing is just straight code. It goes through. It has one entry point and one exit point. And so I can take that, and I can do another refactoring called extract method, which lets me take this chunk of code that didn't have a name before, and I'm going to give it a name. And I like sometimes to have one-line guard clauses, but four, four lines is, is about the maximum that I'll accept. And this is fine with me. I, it's out of my way now. I don't have to care about it anymore. So I'm almost ready uh, to move on to the rest of the method. However, I do still have two copies of that request.xhra call. There's the one that I started with here, and there's the one that I just pushed out into that can't schedule while credit check pending method. And at this point, I'm not quite sure what to do about that duplication, so I'm just going to leave it alone until I know more. And this is an important thing to understand about refactoring. When you are changing things around, sometimes you have to tolerate some duplication along the way, especially if you're not sure what to do about it. Um, that's okay. If it bothers you too much, you can always like throw the code away and come back and start again another time. But sometimes you just got to push through it um, and choose your battles. All right, so as I kept working with the code, I used this same basic tactic again and again. I had some code that the very first thing it said was, is this an XML HTTP request? And I took that if statement and I just pushed it down one level of indentation again and again and again. And that made that block smaller and it gave me a lot of other blocks up above it that I could deal with a little bit more easily. 
And any time I got a chunk of code that was small enough to fold up by itself, I would extract that into a new private method. Uh, I'm going to skip the play-by-play -play because it's pretty repetitive, and just going to show you a before and after view of the original method. This is the before. This is the after. The code on the left is about 50 lines. The code on the right is about 20. This method is still more complex than I'm really happy with, but I can just about hold all of the details in my head as I read through it, so that's an improvement. But the thing that I like most about this method is what isn't there. Request.xhra is nowhere in sight. Of course, the way I got it out of this method was to extract it into five other methods, so let's go see where it went. Um, as I worked with this code, I wound up extracting five private methods that they all have the same basic structure. Uh, one of the short ones we can have a look at. It's if this is an AJAX request, then we render some JSON. Otherwise, we set a flash message and we do a redirect. Now this code is using words like request, render, JSON, flash, and redirect. All of those words are in the domain of a web controller but they're sitting here in an object whose primary method talks about things in the domain of the business process. And this seems like a good time to mention the single responsibility principle. This principle, which is often referred to as SRP for short, is usually expressed as a class should have only one reason to change. Uh, this principle was introduced by Robert Martin, who for some reason likes people to call him Uncle Bob. Um, I prefer to think of him as that guy I blocked on Twitter because I don't have the time or energy for his bullshit. Um, but, you know, he has some good stuff to say if you can get past his politics. Now, as for the single responsibility principle, though, we've been working in a class that I originally named Scheduled Installation because I didn't want to think too much about what it was called. But if we were going to name this class according to the responsibilities it currently has, it might look something like schedule installation and do one thing for AJAX requests and do something else for HTML requests. And this is another side note. This wasn't in my original presentation. When I originally wrote this slide, I was clearly exaggerating for comedic effect. Um, but two years afterward, um, a guy named Arlo Belshi, who used to live here in Portland, and I, I don't know where he is now, uh, wrote a great series of blog posts about what he called the seven stages of naming. After the seven stage, or five stages of grief, I guess, or something. Um, the first stage he labels missing, that's that gray thing on the left, to reflect the idea that often an important concept can be buried inside a much larger method. The second stage is nonsense, because when you first decided to extract that concept, you might not have a very good idea what to call it. And that's a terrible, na terrible time to try to come up with its forever name. Uh, you probably can't read these names along the bottom here, so I'll just read them to you. Uh, the first one here, is, the method is just named preload. The third stage, the pink one, is labeled honest, and the name under that is do something evil to database. Uh, his fourth stage is honest and complete, and the name under that reads parse XML and store flight to database and local cache and start processing. Fifth stage does the right thing. The name here is store flight to database and local cache and start processing. There's nothing about parsing XML in there anymore. The sixth stage of naming he calls intent which is where your method names reveal what you intend to do. And the method name here is begin tracking flight. The seventh and final stage in Arlo's model is called domain abstraction, and the code snippet at the bottom reads monitoring panel, blah, excuse me, monitoring panel dot add new flight, which reads out pretty well. All right, so going by Arlo's seven stages of naming, I would say that this name is somewhere between stage three honest and stage four honest and complete. Um, I hesitate to call it complete because it's just saying do stuff. <laughs> uh, anyway, I mentioned the single responsibility principle, and I mention it because the thing that brought it to mind is this word and. Every and in that name is an additional responsibility for this class. And of the two different of the two ands we have here, of the three uh, things that this, that this method is doing, the bigger contrast is between scheduling an installation and all that other stuff about whether this is HTML or AJAX. So I'm gonna take all of that request management stuff and move it into another object. 
Uh, there are a lot of things that I could name this new object, uh, but because it seems primarily concerned with managing an HTTP response, I'm just going to call it a responder. All right, so quick recap. In the beginning, there was installations controller. And then I extracted a method called schedule installation. Schedule installation had all of this code that still thought it was in a controller, so we had to fake that with method missing. And now I'm going to introduce our responder object. The responder's job, oh, excuse me, I copied this slide and it didn't animate well. All right, the responder's job is to bridge that gap between the domain of the web and the domain of the model. Schedule installation does its thing, and when something interesting happened, it tells the responder, hey, something interesting happened. Why don't you tell the user about that, however they care to know? And it's up to the responder to figure out how to present that information in the context of the current web response, either by rendering some JSON if it's, X, if it's an Ajax request or by setting flash and redirecting. So for right now, this responder is going to use the same method missing hack to forward messages back to the controller. We're just gonna keep passing that thing along and keep sweeping that under the rug for now. Remember, sometimes when you're refactoring, you have to tolerate some duplication and some ugliness in order to get the code to a better place. So with that forwarding in place, I can take all of those extracted methods that I made private in the schedule installation class, and I can move them all down bodily into public methods on the responder class. And at this point, schedule installation is basically just one method, it's call. And the responder is now the biggest chunk of code in this mess. So let's take a closer look, closer look at that. All of those methods that we just moved to responder have this form. If it's Ajax, do this, otherwise do that. Now there are five methods on this class, which means that there are five copies of this branch on request.xhra. And this responder has an identity crisis. It's constantly asking, should I do this or should I do that? I don't know. Unfortunately, there is a refactoring for that too. It's called replace conditional with polymorphism. I take one object that knows how to solve two problems, but always has to ask itself which problem it's solving, and I split it into two objects. Each of them solves only one problem, and now I only have to ask one time to decide which one of those to use. Uh, the implementation on this one is pure brute force. I copy-paste the entire responder class, and I change the names. <laughs> one of them I change to Ajax responder, and one of them I change to HTML responder. By the way, this means I now have 10 copies of that call to request.xhra in my code. But watch this. Back in the controller, I add one more call <laughs> to request XHR. Uh, yes, this goes to 11. <laughs> but watch this. I use that call to decide which responder to create. And once I've done that, I can go back through these two responder classes and delete all of the HTML stuff from the Ajax responder and vice versa. In that process, I also delete all 10 of those request.xhra calls that were in this code. And I think that call to request.xhra tells a really interesting story about this whole process. It started out in the controller, and then I moved it out into that method object that I created, and then I kept making more and more and more copies of it, and then I made more copies of that. And finally, that call has come full circle back into the controller, which I feel is where it belongs. Um, now there's a lot more to this code, um, but that's the end of my slides. Uh, before I go though, uh, I have some resources that you can use uh, to level up your Ruby and refactoring skills. Uh, the Buffy is just for fun. If you haven't read Pooter, this is Practical Object-Oriented Design in Ruby by Sandy Metz. Start there. Uh, this is the first edition. She's put out the second. Uh, if you have the first edition already, she says there's no reason to buy the second. Um, so get whichever one you have available to you. Um, and this book is all about finding different ways to structure your code. It's going to help you notice hidden responsibilities in your code, and it's going to give you plenty of ideas for structures that you can refactor towards. And uh, if for some reason you cannot afford a copy, talk to me in person and I will buy it for you. It is that good. I'm serious about this, and I have done this before. Uh, at some point, you probably should also have a copy, uh, a look at Martin Fowler's book. This is Refactoring, 
Improving the Design of Existing Code. This was one of my textbooks. And um, the first version that I'm holding here has examples in Java. There's a second edition out now that has examples in JavaScript. Uh, a few years ago, somebody published a Ruby version, which you may prefer. They're all, they're all reference books. They're not books you're going to sit down and read cover to cover like you would with Pooter. Um, you sort of skim through it, you get a sense of where things are and how to know how to recognize the, the things that will point you to one or more of those refactorings. Um, there's also a catalog of refactoring techniques at refactoring.com. So if you don't have the book, but you still know that there's a, there's a thing, you just can't quite remember what it's called, you can go here and look for it. But like I said, whichever one you use, the references. Um, you browse through the listings. If you find something that catches your eye, you can go look at it, you can read it, and maybe you can find an excuse to practice that one thing. Um, I also have a few suggestions for practices that are not themselves refactorings, but that they make it much easier to try out new things. I like to commit code every single time my tests pass, if possible. Sometimes I don't, but if you commit every time your tests pass, even if you only changed one line, um, then there's this neat thing that happens. If it's only been 30 seconds since the last time I committed code and I'm already confused, I can just tell Git, hey, do a hard reset. I don't care, get me back to where I was, and I'm gonna start over again. And this is often a lot easier than walking through the undo stack and several different buffers, trying to figure out exactly where everything was the last time the tests were passing. It's just, no, throw it away and start over. Git commits are cheap, and Git history can be rewritten, and neither of those trees of those two statements is true about your time. And just to show you uh, that I practice what I preach, this is a, a view of a refactoring branch that I did. Uh, sometimes I wrote useful commit messages like, uh, what do I have here? Move filter into its own file, uh, fix subtle performance bug, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes I have stuff here that's like white space or extract method or inline method. Those are sort of inverse of one another. And that's the entire commit message. Uh, I have been known to write four commits in a row that all just say extract method, extract method, and so on. You can always squash these together later, um, but I personally like to leave these commits all in a line in case my, my coworkers want to follow along someday and see how I got from point A to B. Because when you squash all of those things together, you just say, here's this magical thing that happened, and suddenly the code is better. And that doesn't necessarily help people follow you from behind. So. Um, since I originally wrote this talk, uh, Kent Beck wrote a blog post about a technique that he calls test and commit or revert, uh, which is either brilliant or ridiculous. Um, and I haven't quite decided which. The idea here is that you write some code and you save it in your editor and then you go and you run a command, which is either going, and it runs the tests, and if the tests pass, then it immediately automatically commits all your changes to Git, and if the tests fail, they delete all of your changes for you. Um, there was a talk about this at this year's RailsConf uh, by Shane Becker. It was quite interesting. I actually watched it today. Uh, among other things, it talks about the history of architecture and master planning at the University of Oregon in the 60s and the 70s. And he talks about some uh, books in the, in the field of architecture, which directly influenced, sounds like, pretty much all of agile development, which is really interesting. Uh, if that sounds like your thing, go watch this talk. So for bigger messes, like the one that I turned into a talk here, um, don't merge the first thing you try. Check out a branch, work on it for a while. Then go back to the beginning and check out another branch and try attacking a different aspect of the problem first. Eventually, you know, if you find yourself doing the same thing twice, you can stop and think about whether you're just reusing a step from the previous pass because you knew how to do it and it was easy, or whether it's because you're starting to find the true shape of the problem. And this is, you know, a judgment call, but it's, it's something to think about. And if you find yourself spending a long time waiting for tests, stop. Figure out how you can speed them up um, and maybe improve your coverage while you're at it. Tests are feedback. It should be easier to just run the tests than to think about whether or not they're going to pass, figure out which ones to run, figure out the command to run just those, I mean, by the time you've thought about that, if you could have just run the tests and seen the results, you would have saved some time and some uh, expensive rocket fuel for your brain. You can work that way. And in practice, in a production Rails app, that's often what I wind up doing. But in a perfect world, I should be able to find out whether or not the tests pass in like 
half a second. That would be great. Uh, one last time, uh, go and watch Therapeutic Refactoring uh, by Katrina Owen. Uh, she covered a great technique for writing really fast characterization tests, which is a wonderful way of covering code that either isn't covered at all or that is only covered with slow tests. I did that for the code example I showed here, and instead of tests that ran in, I think it was like 20 seconds, I have tests that run in a quarter of a second. Um, and the cadence of development when it's that fast is it's just much easier and uh, it's, a, it's a whole different game. Uh, this, ta this talk uh, you should be able to find on confreaks.tv and it may be on YouTube also. And that's what I got. Thanks. So we'll get to questions in just a sec. I do want to mention that all of the code in this presentation is runnable. I think I mentioned that at the beginning too. It passes the tests at every step. And I did get that code running on my laptop. So if there's time and anybody wants, um, I can put it up on the screen here. We can do some live coding. We can do some mob programming. Or if you don't care, uh, we can go with Q&A. We can let that turn into a group discussion. Um, how much time do we have left? At least 15 minutes? Okay. Um, who would like to play with this code while we're all still here together? Anyone? One or two people. Um, would you rather just have questions? A few more nods. If you would like to leave, that's fine too. I, I'm not offended. Uh, okay. And then I will leave this link up here so that if you want to play with this code yourself later, you can write this down. Um, questions? Yeah, Jared. Oh, actually, sorry. Yeah, I'm just curious if you, um, well, basically, I, I recognize a lot of the patterns and thought processes that we go through that increase the controller method. Um, often, Okay, so um, everybody in the room heard this, but for posterity, for the people on the video, I will briefly summarize. Um, I took the approach of t taking all of this code and putting it into a separate object. You said sometimes you've taken a concern or a mix in and you've put it on the controller and you've put all of that code there. Um, both are totally valid. Um, the thing that I like about having things in a separate object, especially when the original one is 800 lines long, is that I I find out very quickly what I'm depending on and not noticing that I'm depending on it. If there's a call to a private method that I didn't bring over, I know that because there's a method missing. Um, like I say, both are fine. Sometimes if it's a small file, I'll just like put a private and then a public declaration right below it because you can, you can switch back and forth in Ruby. And then any methods that I extract from a big one go between those two. So they're private to the outside world, but they're still sort of right there so I can scroll up and down and see them. That's another approach you can take. Once they, they all get you the same place. Does that answer your question? Okay. What else we got? Yeah. Maybe. Um, just for the audience, do you think also because sorry, um, with the um, request section to our method, you have a notion of two different plans. Mm -hmm. uh, when he's trying to do that, he asks about something. And he wants himself, can I maybe delete the code? Because <laughs> you know, you know uh, yeah. the web client. Right. Yeah, yeah, so it would have been really nice if I could have deleted one of those cases, either the AJAX path or the HTML path. However, that would have required me to look at front end code, which I hate. Um, and it might have required me to go and learn things about who was using our application and how and talk to other people. And that wasn't 
those are good things to do sometimes, but I didn't feel at the time like I had the time for that. Um, the other thing, sorry, there was a, I had another thought and I'm trying to, trying to remember what it was. Um, oh, a thing that I skipped over is that there were a lot of asymmetries in the two different code paths. And I, I, I talked about the first one, right? How there, when we started out, there was a guard clause that was inside the begin rescue end in one side, and it was about outside the begin rescue end on the other. A thing I didn't show is that each of those things rescued different exceptions and handled them differently. So the same business conditions at the beginning of the method, depending on what happened, could either raise an exception in one path or not raise an exception in the other path. So this method really sort of resisted that kind of refactoring. Although as I say this aloud, I realize if I could have just deleted one, that would have made things a lot easier. So I wish I'd thought about that. Thank you. <laughs> More questions, comments, creative insults? It's all good. OK, thank you. Oh, wait, wait. Question. Yeah, go ahead. How did I get around the method missing? Oh, um, I got around, I needed the method missing in the first place because I had code that was checking for what kind of request it was, and it was either calling render or redirect or setting flash messages. All of that code went into the response object or the responder object at the end. And uh, I can actually go back and find this. They are in, so this is method is in the controller itself, and the controller is passing a reference to itself into the responder directly. So the responder can just say, hey, controller dot render. So that's how I got around the uh, having to put that request XHR everywhere and have to get around the method missing. Although I might still have used method missing inside the responder, I don't remember at this point. Anybody else think of a last minute question? All right, let's go. Thank you.